Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. <laughs> Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halady. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week we're going to revisit one of Nuclear Hot Seat's most popular interviews with veteran journalist Carl Grossman. If you've ever wondered why there's no news about Fukushima in mainstream media and how this media blackout is enforced virtually worldwide, today's interview connects the dots from before Hiroshima to now. Carl shares expertise honed through more than 45 years of reporting in an extended nuclear hot seat interview. That will be coming up in just a few minutes, along with numbness of the week, and a special heads up on some teleseminars and webinars you won't want to miss. Today is Tuesday, May 6, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Keeping up with the latest from the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, photos taken from re-entry to the underground storage area of the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant showed damage to bags of magnesium oxide. The bags are placed on top of waste containers to prevent the radioactive material from releasing into the environment over a 10,000-year period. Well, looks like they sure blew it this time. The U.S. Department of Energy said it did not know what caused the damage to the bags, but video and eyewitness accounts seem to confirm that there were no issues with the roof or walls in the disposal room. Now, I love this one. Air samples have been taken from 15 locations since the event, and results after February 18, four days, has shown no contamination. But as we know from Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center, the locations chosen to be tested were not necessarily in alignment with the plume and the wind direction, and so were not in alignment with where the radiation release went. Contamination from plutonium does not just disappear unless, in a science fiction turn of events, 480,000 years slipped past us in the blink of a wormhole. Up at the Hanford site in Washington State, which ships much of its waste down to the WIP site, which isn't accepting it, but that's another story. Hanford union workers have told NBC Right Now in Yakima, Washington, that there was an explosion at the plutonium finishing plant cleanup site weeks ago, two weeks ago, but that the event wasn't shared with the public. A Hanford union representative says it happened when workers were cutting some pipe as part of the demolition of the plutonium finishing plant. Workers described the explosion as a spark, then flames that shot out of a pipe, and a loud bang. They say that the contractor is playing down the explosion and possible safety concerns to protect themselves from fine and work delays, and are concerned that management isn't putting worker safety first. Yeah! A Hanford Union representative characterized the site of the explosion as being, quote, probably the most contaminated facilities in the United States and one of the most hazardous buildings. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, protecting people in the environment, not, has allowed Connecticut's nuclear power plant, Millstone 2, to use warmer water from Long Island Sound for cooling one of its two units. The Millstone 2 plant may use water as warm as 80 degrees Fahrenheit, up from 75 degrees in the past. Last summer, Millstone 2 shut down for nearly two weeks because the water was warmer than the 75 degree limit. In response, the NRC, the ones who are supposed to be protecting people in the environment, issued an emergency license amendment allowing Millstone to use an average temperature of several readings. Yet, it was still not enough to prevent the plant from closing down. Molly Lightfoot, Dr. Helen Collicott's associate here in the United States, says the higher the water temperature used for cooling, the greater the risk. This is a bad precedent as we look at warming waters everywhere. 
You can't cool anything, let alone a nuclear reactor, with warm water. And depending on abnormally cold winters to keep the sound, meaning Long Island sound, cooler, is not something you can base regulatory policy on. So if you can't operate within the limits, change the limits. Nobody will notice, except us. Energy Corporation has sued the U.S. Department of Energy over waste disposal costs for a period beginning in 2008 to cover the Vermont Yankee plant. Energy says the DOE agreed in 1983 to take on all disposal costs for Vermont Yankee spent fuel. Last year, it won nearly $41 million to cover pre-2008 waste and related costs. Now they're going after the rest. See, they're a good little corporation, and they don't want the necessary cleaning up of the mess that they've made to cut into their profits. If, like Dr. Doolittle, we could talk with the animals, right now they would be reading us the riot act. Here's the short list. Samples of albacore tuna caught off the shores of Oregon and Washington State show radioactivity from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan, according to researchers. Radiation in some of the tuna had tripled, and the radiation is bioaccumulating not only in the flesh, but in the bones. In California, state health officials are warning us not to eat shellfish, anchovies, or sardines that were caught in and around Monterey Bay. This because of a mysterious toxic outbreak, the highest level of toxins ever seen. Sea lions are showing lesions on their hearts and brains. At least 35 sick sea lions were found stranded on the Monterey Bay, convulsing with seizure-like symptoms. This has also affected the sea otter population. Seabirds' nervous systems are failing. A recent report about the winters of 2011 and 2012 reported an unexpected record number of snowy owls being found dead or dying. And Japanese experts are reporting 105 dead deep sea fish, the photonectes, and blame it on, quote, some kind of abnormality in their habitat, end quote. You think? And in none of this is the F word mentioned, Fukushima. And reports in the last week out of San Francisco Bay of a mass swarming of fish, birds, whales, dolphins, seals, otters. Nobody can remember seeing a conglomeration of sea life this thick before in one place at one time. Perhaps, like the animals in Bambi, instead of escaping from a forest fire, they're running away from radiation and simply ran out of ocean. Last month, thanks to Freedom of Information Act queries filed by numerous organizations, the NRC was forced to disclose email showing the lengths it went to in the immediate aftermath of the Fukushima disaster to downplay the risk of a similar catastrophe happening in the U.S. NRC Public Affairs Officer David McIntyre offered his opinion on what Energy Secretary Stephen Chu should have done when asked by CNN whether American nuclear plants could withstand a Force 9.0 earthquake. Quote, he should just say, yes, it can. Worry about being wrong when it doesn't. Sorry if I sound cynical. End quote. No, you're not sorry. You are cynical and co-opted. Over to Japan, where Tokyo was hit by its worst earthquake since March 11 of 2011. 6.6, .6, followed 10 minutes later by a 6.1. This happened on May 4th. Here's the part I love. There were no reports of damage or other abnormalities from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Did you expect there would be? Spent Fuel Pool 4 could have collapsed. They would have said, hey, no problem. We've got this covered. Up. An NHK documentary on the Senior Brigade, which consists of workers recently retired from top posts in local government, as they went about their decontamination work in Fukushima Prefecture. These people believe that radiation levels will go down after decontamination. The team went to gather mushrooms, one of them saying, this will taste great deep fried. If the radiation counts were low, they hoped to report the good news to the town's people. Instead, what did they find? The mushrooms had 62,700 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. That's 627 times the safety standard in Japan, or 57 and one quarter times the safety standard in the United States. 
a shocking number. The documentary did say they're waging an endless fight against an invisible enemy. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of weight. It's a compound numb nuts this week, brought to you by TEPCO. One month after being put in charge of, listen to the word, decommissioning Fukushima Daiichi, sidebar. You cannot decommission a disaster. All you can do is mitigate it. Anyway, after being put into this position, now Hiro Masuda talked with World Nuclear News about his priorities for the site and the workforce. The article is so convoluted in its double talk that I am going to post a link on the website. Nice to be able to say those words again. But here's the part that really hit me. At one point in the interview, he said that one of his goals is that he wants to reduce the use of full face masks where he can on the 1,200 workers on the site. These masks, he said, have a range of effects. They are used to reduce internal radiation dose, uh-huh, but they slow down work hugely and lead to problems with communication and the quality of the work done. Properly zoning the use of masks is Masuda's top priority to improve conditions for the staff. He is out of his mind. Proper zoning? Hell, if I had to go to Tokyo for any reason, which I can't imagine, I would wear a face mask from the time I got off the plane. Meanwhile, TEPCO has reported an annual net profit of $4.3 billion in U.S. currency. Woohoo! Nothing like having a nuclear disaster to really boost your profits. Yet the company is complaining about the need to continue to support those people who had to be evacuated from the disaster zone and will be cutting off all money to them by next March. What kind of reparations are they still promising to those evacuees? Well, I'm not saying that the money goes to them, but last July, President Naomi Hirose of TEPCO and TEPCO Vice President Jango Aizawa each had one month of their salaries cut by 10% as a penalty. This for delaying disclosure of the leak at Fukushima Daiichi. Why is there no nuclear crimes tribunal to smack these people silly upside the head and put their priorities where they need to be? TEPCO, you are beyond reason. You are beyond conscience. And that's why this week and probably every week, you are nuclear hot seat. None that's not awake. Two short international pieces. Hot particles, nuclear fuel fragments from Fukushima, were detected in air samples taken in Svalbard, Norway. This supports findings that radionuclides emitted from Fukushima were quickly dispersed around practically the whole northern hemisphere within a few weeks of the accident. And because of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, Adi Roche's Chernobyl Children's International a charity that does humanitarian medical work in eastern Ukraine, recently had to cease its operations there. Interview in just a moment, but first, we're back. That's right, the Nuclear Hot Seat website is up again after what was labeled a brute force login attack, originating variously from Japan, Saudi Arabia, Bosnia, and heaven only knows where else. We really are international. Now, the site is not yet in perfect working order. We're working on it. And we're also going to be upgrading with a new theme, a new template, that's going to give us even more security than we already have, which is a lot, as well as more searchability. And this one I really love, the ability to translate the written content into other languages. Now, all of this does not come without a cost. To those of you who have already donated to help us meet the expenses, thank you. We could not have gotten this far without your assistance. Now, more help is still needed to meet this next challenge. So if you can, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, the homepage, scroll down, and there it is, once again, that big red Donate button. Please use it. It is secure to PayPal. And your assistance at this time will go directly 
to covering expenses to make Nuclear Hot Seat's website even better and of more use than ever before. Whatever you can give, whatever you can do. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now for this week's interview. Carol Grossman is an award-winning investigative reporter with more than 40 years of experience. He's an eminence grise within the anti-nuclear movement, professor of journalism at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury. He writes regularly for Huffington Post, and he's author of six books, including Cover Up, which you are not supposed to know about nuclear power. Listen to Carol dissect how the nuclear industry has gamed the media since before Hiroshima. Why it's so tough to get any nuclear news on mainstream media. And some thoughts he has on what we can do to start breaking that log jam. Carl Grossman, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Yeah, pleasure. Now, you are arguably the best journalist our side has produced, with decades of experience covering nuclear stories that leaves a trail of lucidity in their wake. What first drew you to writing about the nuclear problem and the nuclear issues? Well, here where I live on Long Island in New York, there were plans in the uh, in the 1960s to create in the in the parlance of uh, the Atomic Energy Commission and the nuclear establishment then uh, a nuclear park out of Long Island. There were to be seven to eleven nuclear plants on Long Island, providing nuclear generated electricity. So the whole northeastern megalopolis, uh, Shoreham, the Shoreham nuclear power plant, was to be the first of uh, this uh, this amalgam. I was an investigative reporter at that time for the Long Island Press, uh, and uh, I began investigating uh, Shoreham, and I began investigating nuclear power in general. You referred to the current blackout on coverage about Fukushima as the biggest cover-up in history, certainly in the media. How has this been allowed to happen? What is our history with nuclear, and how has it come to this point that we can't seem to get any news in the media visible? What we're undergoing now, which is a huge cover-up, indeed, the first book I wrote about nuclear power, it's titled Cover-Up, What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power, and cover-up is the operative word when it comes to nuclear technology, the suppression of information. It's been going on since the advent of nuclear technology keeping people in the dark, not letting us know about the lethality of this technology. March of, of last year, the, the catastrophe of Fukushima, uh, we're living uh, not just in the aftermath. I mean, that's an ongoing disaster, an ongoing catastrophe. But you wouldn't know it from media. Uh, I mean, there, there's nothing. When was the last time you, you read or heard or saw regarding mainstream media and any information about, about Fukushima? People, lots of people are going to end up dead, not just in Japan, but all through the world because of the, uh, the radioactivity released and continuing to be released out of those, uh, we're talking about six nuclear power plants at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, but the, uh, the media have been uh, basically silent. I mean, Joseph Goebbels, the, uh, the Nazi propaganda minister, would smile in his grave uh, to see how the... Uh, the nuclear establishment has handled quite successfully the Fukushima disaster. How has this been possible for a story of this magnitude to be manipulated out of public consciousness so that even the best, most dedicated reporters are either not able to cover it or if they cover it, they aren't able to get their stories placed? There's a long story behind that, uh, that lack of story. The beginning with the Manhattan Project, this was the crash program during World War II to build atomic weapons. And Leslie Groves uh, was uh, the head of the Manhattan Project, and he made a special visit to the New York Times, and he made arrangements, Leslie Groves did, to hire the Times science reporter, William Lawrence, at the, at the Manhattan Project. An excellent book on this. I mean, I've written a lot about it, but uh, a superb book that I would recommend is News Zero. The New York Times and the Bomb by uh, Beverly Keever. She details in the book how, how General Groves goes to the Times, negotiates with its publisher and its top editorial people, having Lawrence go out to the Manhattan Project. His salary, she writes, would continue to be paid by the Times to his wife while he would be on government salary. This is the beginning. 
beginning of disinformation on nuclear weapons. So this, this, these meetings took place actually before the atom bomb was created, but while it was still in the developmental process and it was still completely hidden. Is that correct? The Manhattan Project was an ultra-secret project, but in the thinking of those behind it, even then, controlling the press, suppressing the press, lying to the press was pivotal. I mean, you could defend some of what happened to a degree in World War II and so forth. Well, for example, when the United States first tested a nuclear device, it was called the Trinity Test. It was out in New Mexico. El Gordo. This is the El Gordo bombing range. This is a month before the bombs were actually dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They, they would have this device explode in the middle of the night, and it would light up, and it did light up a good portion of the Southwest. How to keep that from an inquiring media? Uh, how to, how to uh, lie about it? Well, Lawrence, the New York Times reporter, it turns out, writes a press release prepared to be issued once this device is, uh, is ignited, claiming there had been an ammunition dump explosion. It's given to the Associated Press when inquiries begin to mount, and that's what the press went with. A very small story had been that there was an ammunition dump explosion uh, at the Almogordo Range. So this is the start of the media manipulation that we were not being forthcoming even at the beginning. There may have been security reasons back then, but they were already thinking far in advance of how to spin the story to take people's eyes off of what was actually happening. As you say, it was the war, there were security reasons and so forth, but what soon happens uh, is equally outrageous. Lawrence believes to go in the Enola Gay, the, the B-29 that drops the first atomic bomb uh, to be used in war on Hiroshima. They wouldn't let him on the Enola Gay. They allowed him on a chase plane that followed the, uh, the bomber that went into Nagasaki. But the bombs are dropped, and then he, he writes a story. I mean, I've seen it on, on microfiche in the New York Times about now. He writes it about the Trinity test. Being present, it was like being present at the creation. I mean, he, he lauds what he has seen. And furthermore, he has prepared, Lawrence, a 10-part series on the, on the wonders, the glories of the Manhattan Project, which is distributed by his paper. Now he's back in New York, his paper, the New York Times, to papers, newspapers all around the country for free. And the series does not use the word hardly at all, radioactivity, period. And then Lawrence goes on and on for years, uh, writing about the wonders, the, the great things about nuclear technology. So, so we have a basis already for the first news about this new technology being rigged. It's, it's all pre-written. He's lauding it. He's on the side. He's actually been in the pay of the nuclear industry, the nascent nuclear industry, the government, before he actually gets the story out, but it's already prearranged that it was going to be positive with no criticism. So from that point to later in the process, how did the media evolve around the nuclear issue? So right off, William Lawrence is one reporter for a very important newspaper. That's why Groves went to the Times, consider the paper a record. But this becomes... Um, emblematic of the general situation. For, for example, just let me read perhaps the first couple of sentences in my book, Cover Up. You've not been informed about nuclear power. You have not been told, and that's been done on purpose. Keeping the public in the dark was deemed necessary by the promoters of nuclear power if it was to succeed. Those in government, science, and private industry who have been pushing nuclear power realized that if people were given the facts, if they knew the consequences of nuclear power, they wouldn't stand for it. If people knew that the kind of accidents that happened at Three Mile Island, this book was written in 1980, at the Fermi Reactor, at Browns Ferry, at Windscale, at SL1, among others, the sort of huge catastrophes which have only barely been avoided ought to be expected. They'd be damned upset and would insist a stop be put to nuclear power. So an army of public relations practitioners has been working for decades to, in the jargon of the trade, make the people think of Citizen Adam as a friend before the truth became manifest. How they did it a variety of ways in terms of public relations. And uh, Well, Edward Bernays is considered to be the father of public relations. Which is the title that he gave himself. Well, yes, yes, he's quite a uh, promoter, period. 
uh, a, a nephew of Sigmund Freud, incidentally, and, and he defined PR as engineering public consent. There's an excellent book called Propaganda, which he talks about how you do that, how you manipulate. And what occurred in the, the beginnings of uh, this, this nightmare of nuclear technology is an army, literally an army, of public relations people went to work. They worked at the National Nuclear Laboratories, which still to this day have huge PR staffs. They worked in the industry. And when you talk about nuclear power, nuclear technology, it isn't just big business. It's big government and big science uh, working hand in hand with big media. So, the, the, I mean, any journalist who writes a story, if you're going to write a story about Fukushima, you're going to do a story about San Onofre, you do a story at Indian Point, you do it on a newspaper, you do it on an internet site, you do it on TV, you do it on radio. You can expect a reaction from a, a squad of this nuclear public relations army uh, to get to your editor, to get to your news director almost immediately and begin to apply pressure. But it's more than that, too. It's who owns the media. I mean, the, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide are, are General Electric and Westinghouse. I mean, during that Manhattan Project, our government often contracts out work. You'll go to a government site and you'll see security is whack and hut. A government loves to do that. And during the Manhattan Project, a lot of the work was done by General Electric and Westinghouse, these two huge corporations. And afterwards, what, historically, 80% of nuclear power plants worldwide uh, are of uh, General Electric or, and or Westinghouse design and or manufacture. Again, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power. What company for decades owned NBC and all the various uh, offshoots of the, the CNBC and the, uh, the General, General Electric? Electric. What company for many years owned CBS? But it was Westinghouse. Westinghouse. So here you have, you know, I mean, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power are owning these media institutions that uh, if, if you believe in the press being a watchdog, that that is the press's mission, and I believe that is the press's mission, and that, in fact, is the ideal in the United States for a for free and independent press so that we can hold the government's feet to the fire under any circumstance and be the informers to the public. The framers of the Republic figured out we'll have checks and balances, a legislative and an executive judicial branch, checking and balancing each other, and then a, a free press being a monitor, being a watchdog of the whole kit and caboodle. And those behind the nuclear juggernaut worked, they've endeavored for years to corrupt that, to compromise that role of the media, that role of the press, so they could continue with this. With this, uh, One can't imagine a more deadly way to boil water, which is all nuclear technology is about, using fission to boil water. Carl, let's roll this back just slightly. Shoot. When you're talking about corporate ownership, I'm wondering, was there an actual mechanism in place that went from corporate owners to, uh, the, uh, to the network, to the individual station, to the news director, to the assignment editor, to the reporters? I mean, was there actual communication? Was it just an environment that got created? Were they under direct orders not to cover this? How do you think it became as entrenched as it has become today? Well, again, it's a very complex and broad propaganda program, and it has to do with a lot of those things. I mean, in the United States, censorship mainly, the dynamic of censorship mainly is the sin of omission. You know, if you're working at GE's NBC, you know you're working at Westinghouse's CBS, you know there are certain things you just don't report on. That's one element of it. If, if you're just working at the, uh, the Boise Bugle and you want to write about Idaho National Laboratory nearby in Idaho, you know that those folks from Idaho, the PR, the nuclear Pinocchios, the frankly liars for hire at Idaho National Laboratories or any of the national nuclear laboratories or any of the, the companies in the nuclear uh, business, I mean, these folks, and I've dealt with them for decades, make the liars for hire, the, uh, the Pinocchios of, 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 of the Tobacco Institute, for example, which for decades, I mean, there is a bit of a comparison here, which for decades were able to cover up the relationship between smoking and cancer uh, and to keep the press in line to, uh, to suppress all that. I mean, for, for many 
decades, uh, the nuclear establishment's PR operation really dwarfs what we had seen from the tobacco industry for many years. You know if you're out there in Boise and you write the piece, you're gonna, your editor or your news director is going to get a call from somebody at Idaho National Laboratory. It's a combination of, of, of ownership, of, uh, of PR manipulation, and then even further in cover-up, what I did too, is to show interlocking boards of directors between media institutions. I have pages of this in the book of media institutions and components of the uh, of the nuclear industry. Like I even went further and showed where financing is often mutual, where, 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 where bank money flows to, in this very well orchestrated pattern. Uh, to both. I mean, the, the bottom line here is a massive, a massive cover-up. And if I could just jump back to a second to Fukushima, the Japanese media cover-up has not been that different, nor for different reasons. In, in fact, and this is one of the elements of the Fukushima story, which has not been covered, in 2009, a company called Toshiba bought Westinghouse. And uh, a company called Hitachi bought the nuclear division of General Electric. So now the, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power are really are Japanese brands. To listeners now, how many people have heard that? Uh, among the lack of reporting is that. And that's given a, a very important additional reason for the uh, power elite in Japan to cover up uh, so uh, uh, emphatically, so, uh, so fully. And now we've had the problem that, that even though Japan made that, uh, Prime Minister Noda made the announcement that he was going to um, set a path for no nukes by the 20, by 2030 and then the 2030s, the U.S. stepped in with tremendous pressure and they've had to backpedal from that position. Right, and, and also the nuclear, in fact, it's called in Japan the nuclear mafia, which is a pretty good term. And we're talking about Japan's nuclear interests uh, besides the U.S. pressure. Uh, has resulted in, oh, we're going to go renewable, we're going to do what Germany's done, we're going to, uh, I mean, it, it's so nuts to have over 50 reactors uh, on this chain of volcanic islands. I mean, disaster, catastrophe was being uh, essentially asked for. But in terms of the media in Japan, the same sort of, of pattern that I've, I've explained has been the situation here in this country for, for, for many decades, PR manipulation of uh, of dominate, but a, a lot in Japan had to do with advertising by the nuclear utilities and so on. And since 2009, here you have these two huge gorillas in the nuclear technology field, uh, Westinghouse and GE, coming out of Japan. So in, in many respects, the U.S. has created a model for, well, not just the promotion, the push for nuclear power and nuclear technology, but the, the model for, uh, for the cover-up. But the, for the suppression of the genuine information. Well, oh, yeah. Kyle, as you were, I mean, we've all been aware of aspects of this, but this is really like a unified look at what we're up against and why press releases don't seem to work. We have such a hard time getting reports. Is there, in your vision, any media organization or outlet out there that has the power and the independence to cover this? And how can we who are in the movement move forward in such a way that we are getting this information out so that people can at least have the facts to consider around nuclear as opposed to just the, the, the manipulation? Well, I, I think there's at least two routes here. One, people must do what they can to get media to move on the story. I mean, to call, to, to, to demonstrate, you know, to do the, the media event, the protests, the demonstrations that media will cover if they won't cover the, the very issues, to write those letters to the editor, to try to push mainstream for what it's worth as much as you can to do what, what the press should do to deal with the, uh, the nuclear Pinocchios in the correct way, which is like, get off my back, let the reporters do the job that, they were, that they're supposed to do. So try to do what one can with mainstream media. And while I'm on that subject, and this gets into a whole other area, the, the, the whole issue of reforming media in this country, to, uh, and there's a whole important ongoing campaign to do something about the monopolization and consolidation of media in this country, the corporate control of media, and so forth and so on. Then the, the other major route has 
to do with them, and, and this is very revolutionary. It's really only come about in, in, in recent times using the new technologies of media, new media, like your media, to, to get the information out, to use the Internet in full, to, to do what you're doing uh, in, in, in terms of audio. Uh, I have a company, it's called a nonprofit, it's called Enviro Video, and over 20 years we've produced television programs uh, providing people with information which is well, too hot for television, mainstream television. But you can just go to envirovideo.com, which is also distributed. Programs are distributed on free speech TV to 200 cable systems around the country to through direct TV. And, um, well, you're going to give me a list of media connections, of online connections for that, and they will all be posted with the podcast so that people can just have some click-throughs to be able to start discovering these rich resources that you have. They're rich resources, but what I'd like to say is people have to be empowered to make their own media. A very important issue in recent times about nuclear power is it's become clearly obvious that it's unnecessary, that safe, clean, renewable energy technology can absolutely substitute and can provide all the energy, all the power we need. So the other thing media feel they have to do is not just to sugarcoat nuclear technology and hide the the awful dangers, even in the face of a Chernobyl, in the face of Fukushima, but to discard, to harshly criticize, to ignore the fact that, that say, clean renewable energy technologies are here today and nuclear is, is not needed. And here on the East Coast, you take a paper like uh, the New York Times or even worse, Rupert Murdoch's New York Post uh, campaigning for, uh, well, uh, right now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wants to extend the licenses of those to Indian Point plants, which are just 24 miles north of New York. The NRC has already extended the licenses. The nuclear plants were never seen as operating for more than 40 years because the radioactivity so embrittles the metals. And just the, the machines cannot run safely after 40 years. This has always been the conclusion. And in any case, the NRC has now allowed more than 70 of the 104 nuclear plants in the U.S. to run to 60 years. Is talking about allowing them to run for 80 years, 80 years, can you imagine? That was when they, they introduced a campaign called Is There Life After 60? Right. You know, they were trying to make a joke out of it, but it, they introduced the idea and then they start building on it and that becomes the campaign. Imagine being in a car 70 years old, rolling along on, on your local interstate. Uh, and, and not only have they been doing the license extensions, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, which is really the Nuclear Rubber Stamp Commission for the for the industry and the nuclear establishment, but the NRC has been rubber stamping operating, in other words, allowing these nukes to run hotter and harder. I mean, speaking of asking for disaster, but meanwhile, as I say, there's the New York Times and there's the you know, New York Post and there's Newsday, another major newspaper in the New York metropolitan area, saying, no, oh, no, we should allow these Indian Point plants, which are also on earthquake faults like Fukushima. Just well, and also the terrorists from 9-11 flew directly over Indian Point, and it was actually considered as one of the possible targets. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it wouldn't have been 3,000 Americans dead uh, if uh, it was the American Airlines plane. Mm -hmm. If it would have, instead of hitting the, the World Trade Center, dropped down on one of those nuclear plants just to, again, north of the north of the Bronx line. And, in fact, Al-Qaeda had been then and today uh, considering uh, attacks on, on, on nuclear power plants. In my judgment, it's so clear that we must close every nuclear power plant, period, and, and not in 20 years or 10 or 2 now. Right now, and then let's figure out what to do um, with, it, with, it, with it, the radioactive waste, which is a whole, a whole other issue. But I want to get the focus back on the media. Yep. So if you were to advise a small local group that has gotten together around their neighborhood nuclear issues, be it a plant, be it former uh, uranium mining, be it uh, radioactive contamination, we here in Los Angeles have the uh, very rarely spoken about and virtually unknown nuclear accident that happened in 1959 at the Santa Susana Field Lab in Simi Valley. If we wanted, if you were to advise us in ways to get our media message out or our message out to the media in a way that they would actually hold on to it, what would your suggestions be? Again, there's many, many paths here. 
One, get your whistleblowers. And there are whistleblowers. There are, thank God, honest people around still in this world, and some of them have ended up working for the nuclear industry and establishment. Find them or welcome them to come to you and seek to get their story out. Uh, the, the problem is the nuclear establishment will try to discredit those whistleblowers, and with a compliant media, often succeeds. But the whistleblower, the insider, telling about the, uh, the disasters waiting to happen, the catastrophes waiting to happen at these nuclear plants all over the country, very important. Secondly, there's the issue of you don't need a, a catastrophic accident to relieve, to, for radioactivity to be released. Every nuclear plant routinely is it's called the permissible, permissible to our government emissions. They're forever giving off xenon gas and tritium is, is, is flowing out. Uh, and the consequence has been uh, the, uh, the Radiation and Public Health Project is, is a great source uh, for information about this. The result has been cancer, and we know about the cancer epidemic uh, in our country. The mysterious uh, cancer epidemic that nobody seems to be able to figure out what it's yeah, based well, on, quote, unquote. Yeah, I mean, if you believe the nuclear Pinocchios and the others who say it's not us uh, or in the chemical industry, you know, it's all lifestyle, diet, genetics. But, in fact, there are cancer clusters around every nuclear power plant in this country. And the Radiation and Public Health Project, uh, just go to radioactivity.org on the Internet, and you can see the important studies on that. And a third group is that this, this toxic technology is, as I say, not necessary. And to, to um, somehow to communicate to media, or again, getting back to making one's own media, with one's websites, with the zines, with pod broadcasting, with video, with, you know, on and on in terms of uh, so-called new media, show, explain how, whether it's solar or wind or geothermal, I mean, each part of it, or tidal, uh, wave action, each part of the country, each part of the world would have a different mix. But we could power our society safely. One of the other things, going back to history, which is so important to understand this history, in my work, both in print, books, magazine articles, and on TV, I speak about those few years after the Manhattan Project, 46, 47, 48, and the desperation at those national laboratories that were set up at Oak Ridge, at Argonne, at, at Los Alamos in particular. I mean, we can continue to build nuclear weapons, uh, which the U.S. did, 30,000 nuclear weapons, including the super, the, the hydrogen bomb under it would tell who was given his own national nuclear laboratory, Lawrence Livermore. But, I mean, there's a limit of how many bombs you could, I mean, you can't, couldn't sell can't sell to this day an atomic bomb to even an ally, even to England. What else could be done with nuclear technology to perpetuate the vested interest created during the war, not just these... All these jobs, all this money all, that was flowing into the laboratories and the research. Uh, right, and the corporations, too, the Westinghouse and GE and so So in those years, 46, 47, 48, come these schemes to use... Uh, it was something called Project Plowshare. We would, well, we would use nuclear devices as a substitute for dynamite. You would have nuclear-powered airplanes, nuclear-powered rockets, which I've written a lot about, and that's not over now. Again, I mean, the, the plan now is to uh, have a Mars mission with a nuclear-powered rocket. Well, the, the Curiosity has a nuclear oh. reactor powering it on the surface of Mars right now. That was the first rover sent to Mars, and I've written a lot about that. The earlier rovers were solar-powered, and that worked fine. But uh, then suddenly we needed a plutonium-powered rover, and that's what Curiosity is. In fact, NASA and the Department of Energy and their environmental impact statement for Curiosity set the odds of plutonium being released on this mission. I mean, one out of 100 chemical rockets explodes at launch. Uh, there's been accidents in the U.S. nuclear space program with uh, the worst was in 1964, a, a SNAP 9A plutonium system aboard a satellite came hurtling back to the Earth with the satellite. It failed to achieve orbit. It disintegrated in the atmosphere, spreading plutonium, plutonium-238, which is actually more radioactive than the plutonium-239 that's produced in nuclear power plants or is used in, in weapons, spreading plutonium-238 all over the planet. Indeed, Dr. John Goffman, the University of California at Berkeley, an MD, PhD, in fact, in earlier involved in the Manhattan Project until he saw the light, uh, speaking of, of honest people, 
had long connected the SNAP9A accident in 64 to the spike at the time of lung cancer globally. And in fact, if, if you look at a book on solar photovoltaic, you'll see how NASA was a pioneer in solar power. Yeah, why? Because of this disaster involving the SNAP-9A, and it went to solar power then for satellite. The International Space Station is powered by satellite. So it, this can be done, whether it's in power satellites or the space station or, or a rover for Mars with solar, or power our world with solar and wind and geo. It all can be done. The key here, back to, you know, uh, the issue of media, is, is often if you don't have a press, a vigilant, tough media, an honest, independent press being there, things are going to get out of hand, really get out of hand. And, and again, from the very beginning, from the outset, those behind the, uh, the nuclear push realized that they would have to, in any way they could, suppress the press, to limit the press, to control the press, to cover up, and they have they have, and it's our, and it's a matter of life and death. It's our life and death. It's it's our job today. It's it's our our mission today. Uh, it's our great need today to somehow break the cover up to have people understand. I mean, when when people understand, like after Fukushima, for example, where people got the information and then where they had it. This is very important to some sort of democratic process to exercise their discretion. Uh, for example, in Germany. After Fukushima, suddenly uh, the folks there really got the message. The Greens won politically. The chancellor of, of, of the nation, uh, despite her scientific background, did 180. All 23 nuclear power plants in Germany, uh, which instantly were made by Siemens, plans were to close them down as soon as possible. And Siemens, incidentally, this rather big company, uh, took the position that we're out of the nuclear business. We're going to be in the renewable. We're going to be in the uh, safe, clean energy business. In Italy, there was, thankfully, a media attention to Fukushima, and Brother Sconi had wanted to revive nuclear power in Italy, but there, were, uh, there happened to be a referendum schedule, and, boom, 93% of the Italian voters voted against it, <laughs> the end of a nuclear revival in Italy and so forth and so on. So, <clears throat> so really, the... Suppression that's going on here is crucial to a continuation of a multi-billion dollar industry from people who don't see that you can't do anything with money when you have killed off the future of life on Earth. Yes. And, 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 and just to jump to the American political scene, I mean, Congress is, is in the pocket of both the nuclear industry and these national nuclear laboratories all over the place. I, again, it's just not just the nuclear industry. If it would just be big business, that would be one thing. But it's, it's, it's as I say, big business and big government. This issue is so enormous, but I think you have made it just killer points today about the media's complicity in this, how the media has been gamed and has been gaming us. And I'm wondering if you have any final words of advice you might give to those of us who are activists as to what we can and should be doing to move forward in getting our word out, trusting that the small steps will add up to large steps will add up to us being able to turn this around. This is kind of like, like World War II in a way. All kind of things are going to have to be done and must be done and have to be done. The plan for those 7 to 11 we have plants on Long Island was finally uh, stopped by people functioning politically, doing direct action, by attempting to influence media and making their own media. I mean, a, a variety of tools were used, and the result was uh, Shoreham, though it was completed, the first of the series of nuclear plants never went into commercial operation. It was closed, and the scheme for a uh, 7 to 11 nuclear plants never got off the ground. Likewise, I think people um, have to use whatever they're comfortable with, whether it's civil disobedience, direct action, media work, political work, legal work, whatever, and do it locally with your local anti-nuclear group, your local safe energy group, uh, doing it uh, nationally with organizations like uh, Beyond Nuclear, uh, the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, Greenpeace, among others and become active on this issue, very active on it. Decades ago, the, uh, the slogan was active today or radioactive tomorrow. And uh, I'm afraid, well, as, as, as the fallout from Fukushima continues to spread over this country and over this world, 
people are becoming impacted by that radioactivity. We just must, we must stand up and just stop this demonic force that has warped our energy future and in terms of media has, has just uh, corrupted American media. Carol Grossman, this has been an amazing talk. I think you have given us plenty to think about. What I'd like to do is uh, let people know what your website is because you do have available a free download of uh, your book, Cover Up, which you are not supposed to know about nuclear power. So would you please give us your website? Yeah, it's just got to, people should go to Carl Grossman, call with a K, Grossman, one word, dot com. And uh, the folks uh, who published Cover Up, what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power, actually wanted to put out a new edition after Fukushima, and I wrote a new intro, a 20-page intro, and nowhere. They couldn't get any interest in a new edition, but the publisher then just put the book right online, and you could uh, you can download it for free online. Lots of documents and all that, and that new introduction in terms of television. Just go to envirovideo.com, one word, envirovideo.com. One I would suggest, this is one on Chernobyl, which I did a few days, six days before Fukushima, March 11th, uh, began, and then I added an, a piece on Fukushima. It's called Chernobyl, A Million Casualties, and that's based on, speaking of media cover-up, a very, very important report, a book uh, published by the New York Academy of Sciences, done by a team of European scientists saying that the consequences of the Chernobyl, 1986 Chernobyl disaster, excess deaths, particularly cancer, all around the world, and they present medical evidence of this. We're talking about 985,000 deaths they connect to Chernobyl. Have you read about that? Have you heard about that? Have you seen anything about that on mainstream media? Mainstream media, no. I've only heard about it through our own channel. You can, you can watch that program for free, uh, either at envirovideo.com or envirovideo.blip.tv. And uh, just Google my name, and uh, you'll see, uh, like, many, 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 many articles. And uh, Folks should get active themselves, too, in terms of gathering information, disseminating information. I mean, there's, there's this media revolution that we're undergoing, I think, can do an end run around, a successful end run around the hold of traditional media institutions by these uh, evil influences, such as those behind uh, nuclear technology. Oh, my God, can we bottle you? <laughs> <laughs> Cal Grossman is an investigative journalist who has specialized in reporting in a variety of media on nuclear and other issues for more than 45 years. Thank you so much for being with us today on Nuclear Hot Seat. A reminder that the full story of how I got from one mile from Three Mile Island to my current position with Nuclear Hot Seat is written out in full in my new nuclear memoir, Yes, I glow in the dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's available on Amazon as a Kindle. You can get free software to read Kindle on any digital device. And know that the book is not only my personal story, it's also a guidebook as to how people can learn more about the nuclear issue and become involved themselves. Thanks for supporting me with your purchase, and I look forward to having you read and enjoy it. For our activist shout-out this week, we hear from Scott Portsline of Three Mile Island Alert in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Later this month, our friends at the Nuclear Information and Resource Service is holding another important webinar, and we are inviting you to join us for 90 minutes to discuss how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission manipulated and rigged their latest severe accident consequences study. They call the report SORCA, and that stands for the state-of-the-art reactor consequence analyses. This is the same type of study that gave us the phrase that a meltdown could render an area the size of Pennsylvania permanently uninhabitable. That line made famous in the China syndrome actually came from the NRC's Rasmussen report. Now, we are inviting activists and reporters to join us to learn about the faulty conclusions of SORCA. The NRC have a history of questionable or faulty probabilistic risk assessments, and SORCA is another. We have concluded that the NRC will be forced to withdraw its accreditation of SORCA as it did for the Rasmussen report. And you, as an activist, can help make this happen. So to join the webinar with Tim Judson from NEARS, 
Eric Epstein, also from Three Mile Island Alert, and me, Scott Portsline, to be part of the action, send an email to TIMJ, that's Tim Judson, TIMJ at nears.org. The date and time have not been finalized. You will be sent an email with your personal password for you to participate by phone or preferably by computer where you'll be able to see the presentation live. The NRC is concluding that a severe accident will not cause immediate harm to people. This webinar will reveal data which was ignored and why the state-of-the-art computer modeling and analysis is a faulty methodology. You won't want to miss this because it's about to become national news. Scott, from your mouth to everybody's ears. John Stewart, don't know how to make nuclear funny? Ask me! I'll get to him yet. Here's today's final thought. Learning about radiation and all the negative news around it can be in many ways as toxic as radiation itself. It can lead to anger, despair, depression, rage, compulsive behaviors, and the one adaptive behavior we in this movement deny ourselves, denial. We face the radiation beast all the time. And truly, it can suck the joy out of life and leave us flat on our backs. To deal with physical protection from the impact of radiation on our lives, I'm developing a series of teleseminars on radiation awareness and protection with Kimberly Roberson, founder of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. Kim has a private practice as a certified diet counselor and nutrition educator. She brings decades of experience, activism, plus her amazing credentials to these teleseminars. I bring research and interviews I've done over the past several years for Nuclear Hot Seat. I bring the research, education, and what I've gleaned from interviews that I've done over the past several years from Nuclear Hot Seat, as well as my own explorations into how to preserve my own personal health. We'll be breaking this program out to the general public as of June, and as we get closer to the launch, I'll let you know more about it. As for the less tangible impact of radiation, we need to take care of our hearts and of our spirits. To that end, I'm currently researching a monthly series of interviews to take place outside of Nuclear Hot Seat that will cover more spiritual and energetic ways of resisting the negative nature of all things nuclear. The goal is to uncover and share the most advanced, esoteric ways for us to get beyond the fears and into our personal power. Body, mind, and spirit have to take care of it all. I'll let you know when that series is together as well. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 6, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, power.eng.com, NBC Right Now, law.360.com, Santa Cruz Sentinel, KION, KSBW, Fukushima Diary and our friend Yori Mochizuki, Reuters, U.S. Today, Oregon State University, RT.com, British Columbia Ministry of Agriculture, Vice.com, AP, NHK, 3news.co.nz, Asahi Shimbun, Japan Today, Alaska Marine Science Symposium, World Nuclear News, they're pro-nuke, but boy, they sure give me great numbnuts, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Stop by, say hello, be our friend. Special thanks this week to Mike Fluke and Richard Viasanov again for their ongoing help with the website DHAC and installation of some kick-ass security measures. Theme music for this show was written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. Our archive is available on iTunes, and yes, it's back on the website. Yay! And with the new theme, it will be searchable. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed to nonprofit organizations and individuals. You have my permission to reuse this as long as you provide proper attribution, meaning the website my name, and the email. This is Libby Halevi of Heart History Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call, so don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. <laughs>